Hello and welcome again to Dr. K's Psychobabble and to support some of my classes and sort of get this topic off the shelf, I'm going to talk a little bit about research methods. And this is a generic approach to it. You know, I teach a number of different kinds of social sciences and social sciences tend to use the same sort of uh, methodologies to gather information. So I'll do this little video and it's sort of applicable to all of the social sciences, although there are some specific methods that have been developed that are particularly oriented to particular fields like sociology or human development or things like that. The first thing to talk about is why do we need a methodology? And that is in order for us to have information that we can distribute and benefit society from, we want to make sure that that information is accurate, valid, reliable. The methods of, of collecting that data and interpreting the data were based upon scientific standards and that the entire process has been reviewed not only by the individual who wrote the paper, but by their peers. So we have peer reviewed work and the standards by which the entire world of social sciences applies its science is through this shared methodology of how we go about gathering information, interpreting and analyzing that information and publishing that for people's consumption. So the first thing we're going to talk about is actually the generic process of research methods. And it starts off with the definition of the question. So follow the little red dot here. So the definition of a question is just like you and I, researchers in social sciences, have they're curious. They're curious about why people behave in a certain way. And so they want to define that question using the language that is specific within the field in which they're studying. And it's, it's important as we're defining those questions, some of that information about how we define the question actually comes from the next step. When we gather information about what we already know about this particular issue, we may discover that there's an existing language within the field that describes that phenomenon. And in order for us to be able to communicate accurately to other researchers, we want to use that shared and agreed upon language. Sometimes, in fact, the research is about the language. Do we have something really categorized or is it accurately described out there? So sometimes that actual definition is what we're doing a research paper on. But Oftentimes, we're actually using that shared language in order to discover what we already know and then find out where our particular question fits into that in order to fill a gap and a, a space of not knowledge, of where knowledge is missing on a particular area. So researchers seek to ask a question specific enough that when they get their findings, they can help fill that gap. Now, based on the information that we've gathered already, we formulate what we call hypotheses. And these are guesses, they're educated guesses based on the preponderance of the evidence that we have looked at so far as where do we think things are going to go. Now, sometimes the preponderance of the evidence is pointing in a direction that the researcher thinks is not the correct uh, direction. So they have a choice. Do they do they propose their hypotheses going along with the research that's been done so far and agreeing that that's what they'll get? And then if they're right, they'll end up with a null hypothesis. They'll have they'll provided evidence that that is not true. Or do they actually come up with the hypotheses that they think their idea is true and evidence toward supporting that hypothesis is what they're going to be uh, hoping to gather? Either way, we have to admit it sort of creates a little bit of a bias. The, the, the researcher is going in with some ideas and notions about how things are going to turn out. However, researchers are also taught to, you know, even though we have those biases set aside, this is what I think is going to happen. We make effort and we have discipline to ensure that the actual data that we collect is what 
actually uh, we use to make that determination. So as we move along here, we test our hypotheses, and this is really that gathering of data, the methodologies that I'm going to go over in just a bit about how we actually gather information and then how we analyze it after. How do we look at that information, either statistically or qualitatively? Then we interpret it. We draw conclusions. Is, is the data that I gathered in support of my hypothesis or is it in support that my hypothesis is incorrect? Now, the way that actually gets written out in research is there's a, there's a uh, all, what's called an alternative hypothesis, and that's the one, that's what I think is going to happen. And it's called an alternative because in the science of social sciences, we assume the assumption is no relationship exists. So that's called the null hypothesis. That's where we start. So we assume our discipline assumes that there is no relationship between two variables or something like that until I have data to show that there is a relationship. So I don't start with the assumption that it is a relationship. I start with the assumption that it is not a relationship. So in gathering evidence, if the evidence points that there is a relationship, I can reject the null hypothesis and accept the alternative hypothesis, which there is a relationship. Alternatively, if my data indicates that there is no relationship, I reject the alternative hypothesis and I go with the null hypothesis. So there's always two hypotheses, at least. Sometimes there's many, many uh, hypotheses as we look at complex models of behavior, but at least two, one alternative, which is saying there is something going on, and one is a null hypothesis saying there is nothing going on. We then use that information to interpret from our data, do we reject the null hypothesis or do we reject the alternative hypothesis? And then look, we tell people about it. We publish our results, publish them online. We make little videos. We talk to people at our colleagues. We talk to people at conferences. And then as we get that feedback system, we go back and we do it again. We might define our question. We might look at different ways of doing it. We may, we may find that our methods were faulty, whatever that is. So we end up in a circular process as the science as a whole builds up over decades of time, our fund of knowledge that we refer to as the literature of the field. So the psychological literature, the sociological literature, the anthropological literature, the biological literature, chemistry literature, all of that. Each field has its body of knowledge built up by hundreds and thousands of, ex of studies like this that have gone through these processes. And that is what we hang our hat on per se. So let's take a quick look at each one of the major ways in which we gather data, the methodologies that we use, and probably the most common one, I'm sure you've heard of them, are surveys. Now surveys ask questions and our participants answer those questions. Now surveys are actually a very, very broad category of methodology for gathering information. Certainly there's the survey you've all probably done. You, you know, you get it in the mail or something or someone gives you a phone call and we're doing a survey for whatever and they ask however many questions and you gather information that way. But it's interesting also to contemplate that all your tests, assignments and whatnot that you do in class all fall under the category of surveys. They're actually the same sort of, I'm asking questions. I'm asking you to put your answer down on those questions. Now, my use of that particular tool is to assess your comprehension of the material. I could then take that material, I can then use that to, to decide upon a grade. I could also use that information to decide upon changing my teaching methodologies. If everybody's not getting it, then the problem might be me. My product. So we use surveys to help make decisions in that kind of way, including 
all the tests that you've been taking throughout your scholastic career. So we move here to field observations or direct observations. You're in the environment in which the behavior is taking place and you are directly observing the behavior. In some cases, you are, it's known that you're there, so you're embedded in the actual environment, and other times you're not. You might be using cameras, or you might just be, you know, in the background, and you, you don't make your presence known, kind of thing. So those different methodologies in terms of directly observing behavior as it happens in its natural environment. We have ethnographies. Now, ethnography is, is, is very much a common tool within sociology and anthropology fields within the social sciences. And what they look at is groups and how they, you know, how they interact and whatever, you're answering a question about a group. And a complete ethno ethnography is a huge undertaking of a descriptive study of a in a way, an ethnic group or anything, but you can actually use this methodology to study any group. You're taking into account culture, you're taking into account identity, the psychology of those groups, how they interact, the history of all that's very um, multi-dimensional methodology. And you can really do uh, an ethnographic study, let's say on your own family. You could do an ethnographic study on the New England Patriots. You could do a ethnographic study on the French people of Aroostook County. You can do an ethnographic study on any group, a class, let's say at, uh, at KVCC. You could look at the class of 2020, the graduating class of 2020. There's a very good reason for us to do an ethnographic study on them. I know as I have students coming to my class during that year that the pandemic significantly impacted their perception and relationship to learning in school. And so that was it's an interesting shared quality of that group. And we can study that using the tools of ethnographies. Now, additional to this, we have case studies. Similar, now case studies, we always think one individual and that's, that's good, but a case study can also be a group. We're looking at that family as a case study of families. We can look at a business as a case study of businesses. We can look at a team as a case study. Kind of the way we use just different kinds of methodologies within this method that we would use that were slightly different than doing an ethnography. So a case study is an example of the type of phenomenon that you're looking at. Secondary data analysis. This is when we look at data that has already been gathered, research data that has already been gathered, and we do a different analysis or we do a more thorough analysis. We might look at a previous research. We might do a, a what's called a meta-analysis, which is looking at a number of studies and finding trends in the studies themselves. That kind of research, looking at existing data, and that's closely related to archive research. And this is looking at data from the past. Now, you can see how these are somewhat the same thing, but secondary data analysis is really looking at research data and applying maybe new statistical measures for it or actually applying a different kind of approach to using that same data. Archival research is when we look at existing records out there about individuals or groups, might look at for comparing businesses, we might look at archival data on their relative profitability over time. When we, look, we do that with stocks and comparing stocks, those are all sort of, you know, archive research looking at performance in the past. We can look at individuals and we can look at their school records, for example, and study a person's past in their in relation to school, but we're looking at archive data when we're doing that kind of that kind of research. And finally, experiments. Experiments involve the actual manipulation of the circumstances under which somebody is acting so that we can control and study specific variables that we are interested in. So if we wanted to look at the effect of a particular teaching methodology. We, we might create a classroom environment 
manage the sampling, get a group in there, expose them to that teaching methodology, compare it to a different methodology, let's say, in a, in a one-factor test, and compare those two groups to see if one method was superior to the other. The experiment allows us to, to, to a greater degree, control the extraneous variables, which may also impact the variable that we're in, under study. So the time of day affects the way people learn. So in an experiment, we would make sure that every time we do that experiment, it's at the same time of day and factor out time of day as one of the variables associated with that experiment. Now, all of these, in terms of generic research methods, there's two major categories. One is quantitative, where we're dealing with data that's numbers, and one's qualitative, where we're looking at, I hate to use the word again, but the qualitative aspects or the, um, the sense of different aspects, let's say the artistic quality or the, um, the depth to which somebody understands something. When we analyze those kinds of variables using all of these methods, we have qualitative research. Quantitative is going to gather data that is at least in some form numerical, and we're going to use statistical tests to make our decisions about our outcomes and our hypotheses. In addition, another variable that we look at is the time in which do, are we looking at something right now or are we looking at something that happens over time? So we have some terms to describe those differences between research methods. One of them is snapshot, and then we have longitudinal studies, and then cross-sectional studies. Now, a snapshot is we're getting all the information right now, and we're going to look at that data information. Tomorrow it might be different, but that's what we're going to you know, uh, rely on is that information we gathered during this one time that we gathered that information. Longitudinal data is that you're conducting the survey, field observation, ethnography, case study, whatever, over a period of time, gathering repeated measures of the same variables to not only identify relationships between variables, but to identify how they change over time. Now, in developmental studies, human developmental studies, the challenge of doing longitudinal research is the researcher is aging as well. So if you're going to study childhood to death, you're probably going to pass away before you get to the end of your study. So another way in which that we study how individuals change over time is to do cross-sectional, where part of my study will look at five-year-olds, another part of my study will look at 10-year-olds, 15, 20, 25, 30, all the way. I can look at all those different ages at the same time. There's pluses and minuses associated with those benefits. I get to do the whole study, but I am looking at individuals that uh, their social clock, their historical clock is different. You know, the time in history in which they were born affects their behavior and will become a variable in determining relationships that I'm looking at from this experimental basis. So, from this research basis, sorry. So that's sort of a summary of the, of the methodologies that we use to gather information. Again, this goes through a process, like I said, it's a circular process, cyclical, over and over, to produce good data that we can then make important social decisions and personal decisions about when we use this data in the real world. So, that's it for social science methods. And I look forward to seeing you at the next video.